And now, I would like to present Diane Dorigo. Diane and I work together, and we're both very proud, aren't we? We sure we are. Sure are. Because she's one of the reasons there is no radioactive waste up at Ward Valley. So I present to you Diane Dorigo, who is with Mears of Washington, D.C. Okay. Uh, yes, I'm Diane Dorigo, Nuclear Information and Resource Service. I've um, been tracking the nuclear waste issues since I found out about it in the very late 1970s and um, have worked to help people prevent new dumps and to uh, stop making more waste so that we don't have to have new dumps. What I was asked to talk about today is uh, the threat of centralized interim, so-called interim storage. So I'll give a little context to that. What I'm going to go over are um, the dangers of radioactive waste, which Kevin touched on, and how it's stored. And he already showed us the pools and the, the dry storage uh, containers. They're a thin and thick wall in various different types of vertical and horizontal. Um, why centralized storage is being proposed, even though it doesn't make any sense, and the dangers of transport, which Kevin covered, uh, dangers of reprocessing if we have time, um, coming from a place that reprocessed irradiated nuclear fuel, and um, I will go over the federal legislation and the licensing that are underway right now of the centralized storage site. So what I'm not going to really delve into, but I want to let you know is happening. Uh, there are various government designated classifications of radioactive waste, high level waste, so called low level waste, um, and now, despite many, many successes in preventing it, we're going to have, if we don't stop it, very low level waste, which is uh, pretend that it's not radioactive waste, waste that would go into commercial recycling, uh, reuse as consumer goods, um, also into regular garbage dumps and possibly incinerators, whatever happens with non radioactive materials. Uh, the public interest movements across this country have fended this off since it was first conceived at least 15, 17 times since I've been in my job here in Washington um, in 1986, but actually a few times before that. And like Judy Treichel says, she was here from Nevada, every time we win, we win the chance to come back and play the game again and fight again. When we lose, we lose badly. But when we win, we get the chance to do it over again. And so here we are again. We're going to have to stop the uh, effort by the government, the industry, the, probably the National Academy of Sciences, uh, to try to pretend that the lower level waste is not radioactive enough to worry about and let it out. But I'm here for high level waste, so I, that's what all I'll say on that unless it comes up in questions. And um, the various things that can happen with high level waste, uh, the Production in the fuel pools, the storage in the, uh, I'm sorry, the production in the core of reactors, the storage in the fuel pools, uh, the eventual movement then into dry storage, and then various types of containers, thin or thick walled, um, hardened on site storage, or whatever the least expensive option is that the utility can get away with. Um, even if the idea is very foolhardy, like burying it in the beach uh, in San Onofre. Uh, and then there's the even worse option of reprocessing it, that is moving it to a centralized place, chopping it up into dissolving it in chemicals and extracting uranium and plutonium. You then have liquid high-level waste, and then took over a decade to convert the little bit of reprocessing waste that formed at West Valley into solid and now we've got solid high-level waste, so we have irradiated fuel. If we do reprocessing, we have liquid and sludge and all the waste along that processing. And then we would have um, high-level waste 
solid, which still needs a place to go. So it's not that, um, th there's no good option. And I want to be positive, though, because we in this movement, in this country, have prevented a lot of um, reactors. We have prevented a lot of manned waste sites. We are now uh, charged with preventing the movement of this material back and forth on our roads and rails and barging on our waterways for potentially 40 or 50 years. Um, and as Kevin pointed out, each of those containers, the radioactivity can be detected a, a half a mile each way, which means that it's emitting even beyond that, possibly. And uh, there's no safe level. So maybe I should jump ahead to high level radioactive waste, uh, if you haven't um, gathered it thus far, is extremely deadly. And when it first comes out of the reactor core, immediate death in seconds. It has to stay shielded, it has to be stored in fuel pools uh, to shield it radioactively and to cool it thermally, and it has to be remotely handled. Um, and then if it's high burn-up fuel, it needs to stay in the fuel pools possibly more than 20 years to decay enough to be handled still remotely. And as um, uh, the slide indicates, that after 10 years, uh, it could still uh, cause death within a week if you're exposed to unshielded. And um, Dr. Makajani pointed out that if we continue to make irradiated fuel until we've got 100,000 metric tons, we've now got a range of 80,000 metric tons in the United States, that we will have enough material for 120,000 nuclear bombs. Dr. John Goffman from California here, uh, he uh, documented, showed that there is no safe dose of radioactivity. And Dr. Carl Morgan, who is considered the father of health physics, he also has said there's no dose or dose rate below which um, you're safe. Let's see. Let's see. Oh, I just wanted to list um, that at high doses of radiation, um, not irradiated fuel directly, but perhaps further away if there were an accident in high doses to work or to uh, emergency responders or people downwind, that the, the health effects from high doses of radiation are, um, are acute um, radiation sickness, nausea, vomiting, fatigue, seizures, coma, skin damage, blisters, hair loss, and death. So that's the high level exposure. And then um, at low doses, cancer and reduced immunity, heart disease, um, and the radiation establishment was careful when they first started up to only identify uh, cancer as the health effect that they would look at. So even looking only at cancer and ignoring everything else, it, it has been shown by the National Academy of Sciences uh, repeatedly and specifically in the Beer Seven report, biological effects of ionizing radiation, that uh, women get 50% more cancer than men from the same amount of radioactivity. And children, as we have known, are more susceptible, their cells are rapidly dividing. Children get more than adults, and so baby girls, infants, are the most vulnerable to radiation. And we all are dependent on baby girls for the future of our species. That's where the ova for all of our future generations are. So that's not being considered when we're talking about radiation protection. So I wanted to just make that point in case anybody thought that this was uh, not important enough. But I, I think that uh, it is important, and it's a lot of why people are fighting these issues. So high-level waste is the irradiated fuel from the core of a nuclear reactor. It's comprised of assemblies that are made of rods that are made of pellets of compacted uranium-235 and a couple hundred uh, rods per assembly, a couple hundred assemblies go into the core. High burn-up fuel is fuel that has more uranium-235 than the others. Uh, the uranium-235 in those 
rods, uh, when bombarded with neutrons, splits, give off the binding energy to turn the water, heat the water, turn the turbines, and make electricity. Uh, and uh, beta radiated fuel, as I said, uh, can give a lethal dose unshielded. If those same elements that form, the cesium, strontium, iodides form when the uranium splits, and they're all very biological, many are bi very biologically active, when they leak out of the rods, they are presto low level waste. And if they're captured in the filters and resins, then that's quote low level waste. And uh, that, in this country right now, it is legal to bury it in licensed unlined soil trenches. Um, so it's not. Um, it's not truly being isolated. Then if it doesn't get picked up, if the radioactivity is not picked up by the resins and filters, then it's routinely released into the water. And the government has provided the industry with legal uh, release levels. And all of these nuclear waste dumps, low-level dumps, high-level proposed dumps, have legal release rates. Uh, they're not really even trying to isolate. There's not a goal of preventing release. Uh, what's happening is there's uh, legalization of the, the releases. So, uh, and as I, I mentioned, the high-level waste can be stored. It, well, it comes out of the core, goes into pools, has to. Um, it can be stored in dry storage then. Uh, could be hardened, but we've not been able to get enough public pressure and enough uh, force uh, to require the industry to uh, do hardened on-site storage. And there's also now, uh, beyond the hardened on-site storage principles, developing, um, I'm, I'm calling it for short, Haas Plus um, requirements that people in communities should be able to demand uh, better ca containers, uh, rather than the thin wall containers, five eighths inch thick, to have uh, thicker containers that are monitorable and uh, potentially recontainerizable. And I've also, I've, I've already mentioned that some of the fuel in other countries gets reprocessed. In this country, fortunately, we're not reprocessing anymore. We did a little bit in the 60s to 70s and are still uh, working to clean up that one site. And um, so reprocessing does happen in a few other countries, but it is not an answer. It only makes the problem worse. So not having a permanent repository, not having a way to make it not be radioactive anymore, uh, not having any other alternatives, but having uh, 100 plus reactors that have operated in the country at, I think it's 83 different locations, uh, we've got a radiated fuel built up. And uh, so there's been a big push, and Senator Feinstein actually has been one of the advocates for centralized interim storage. I've put interim in quotes every single time. You can flip to the next one. Uh, I've put uh, interim in quotes because it implies that it's really only going to stay there for a little while and then it will go somewhere else. And theoretically that's what's intended perhaps, but there's also the possibility that it may never go anywhere else and we're moving it now to a place that's no better than where it already is, not designed for high level waste long term permanent isolation, but just another parking lot dump. Uh, waste control specialists. So the um, the federal law right now does not allow for, to, it's illegal to have so-called centralized interim storage. There was a time between 1987 and 1990 when the federal government proposed that a nuclear waste negotiator try to find a place that wanted to be a centralized storage location. It was called monitored retrievable storage at the time. And the target was Native American nations. and. After three years of the nuclear waste negotiator trying to convince uh, Native American uh, lands that they wanted to be the repository of this waste, um, none of them did take it. And the time expired, and it is no longer legal uh, to have uh, centralized interim storage. That's why HR 3053 wants to change the law. The other thing that was during the time when it was OK to have a centralized site uh, it had to, uh, it couldn't operate until there was a permanent repository. So in the absence of a perma re permanent repository, you couldn't have a temporary site. What HR 3053 will do is to legalize centralized storage, 
direct the Department of Energy to enter into a contract within 18 months of passage of the of passage of the legislation for centralized storage. And these are the companies that want to uh, enter into those contracts. They're trying to get licensed right now at the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, waste control specialists in Texas and Holtec in New Mexico. And the Nuclear Regulatory Commission, despite it not being legal to have a centralized site, is proceeding with their applications. So the waste control specialist site is already a uh, nuclear waste dump for so-called low-level waste. And it is proposing to expand to take, uh, they're asking for five, um, 5,000 metric tons and expand to 40,000 metric tons. Uh, the whole text, and that's in on the borderline between Texas and New Mexico on the western, far western part of the lower part of the panhandle, uh, right across the border from Eunice, New Mexico. And then um, the other site is about 30, 40 miles away between Hobbs and Carlsbad, not far from the um, waste isolation pilot plant, and that site is uh, targeted, is proposing for 70,000 metric tons, but could go up to 100 to 120,000 metric tons of irradiated fuel. So we've got, as I said, about 80,000 metric tons already around the country, and we generate with the rate we're going now about 2,000 metric tons per year. And um, so these are the places that we'd like to get licensed. Now, waste control specialist application was uh, submitted in late 2016, and in 2017 it began being processed. It had some public comment periods, but the company waste control specialist wanted to get bought out by somebody else and another company, and that didn't go through, so they're waiting until they're um, purchased by a, a new owner before they proceed with their application. They put it on hold, and the Nuclear Regulatory Commission has that one application on hold with a clear intent by the company that they want to resume. In the meantime, the whole tech company, which is partnered with the Eddie Lee Energy Alliance, uh, these, um, this is the one that is uh, halfway between, it's between um, Carlsbad and Hobbs in southwest New Mexico. And it would, uh, as I said, um, store, it, it wants to store as much waste as we can produce in the country. They're uh, asking now for 70,000 and they would go to 100 or 120,000 if that were made. Now their technology is to have the canisters uh, underground in the uh, concrete tubes that are being built too deep. They say it would take four hours to put the waste in or take it out, and they've got two layers, and they're gonna actually have it uh, below grade, but at grade, so this would be like a parking lot dump that's uh, got a lower level. The uh, waste control specialist site is a parking lot dump for containers, the same concrete containers uh, that would be um, on a pad above ground, right next to its uh, hazardous and mixed waste site and its um, weapons and commercial burial sites for and processing sites for other radioactive waste. Next one. Uh, Kevin showed you the transport routes uh, across the country that would uh, go to Yucca, and they're very similar to the ones that would go to the uh, West Texas site and the uh, New Mexico site. This is a waste control specialist map of uh, their uh, projection for waste coming from across the country to their site. This is a pretty light map, but you can see a larger view of um, where the, the sites are in West Texas and in uh, Southeast New Mexico. Go ahead. This is an overview of the waste control specialist site. Um, as I said, they have other facilities already there. So-called low-level waste is not low risk. It can have all the same elements as high-level waste, as I mentioned, plutonium, cesium, strontium, and it does. And some of the waste that's buried there, they've got three different facilities. Um, some of it is t uh, technically could be considered high-level waste according to the National Academy of Sciences already, and uh, there's hazardous waste there. So they want to add more to their uh, arsenal.
Waste Control Specialist has been really uh, effective in lobbying the Texas government and, uh, and working hard on getting legislation passed to change the law that I mentioned right now. They want to make uh, centralized storage legal and they want to uh, uh, be able to get out the money that was put aside for the permanent repository. There's a fund that was set up for money that would isolate the waste permanently, and both Holtec and Waste Control want to um, have access to that money, even though they are not permanent repositories. And I'm not sure what um, is on this here thing, uh, but the other thing I wanted to share is that uh, this company, Waste Control, is one of the highest contributors to former uh, governor of Texas and now De Department of Energy Secretary Rick Perry, and he's a real supporter of, of them. Uh, the Ogallala Aquifer runs from Texas all the way up to uh, South Dakota. It's the largest freshwater body in the country, and when Waste Control was first putting in its application to have a so-called low-level radioactive waste dump in its location in West Texas, uh, they worked with and provided information to the Texas Water Board to change the map so that the Ogallala Aquifer would be six miles away from their site. They proceeded to um, do a slap suit against someone who had a website called Save the Ogallala Aquifer um, to make it clear that people should not be talking about the presence of the aquifer in their nuclear waste, or, or you could get so and Holtec is applying for uh, bringing in the waste, and both of these companies want to uh, shift the liability from the uh, utilities, where it now lies, to the federal government. Under current law, the liability doesn't shift until it goes to a permanent site. So that's another thing that would enable uh, their, their projects to work, is that utilities would send their waste there because then they could get rid of liability for it. So we've got the bill in Congress, H.R. 3053, and I've got one page alerts on the back table. If you could please contact your um, Congress members um, and nearby Congress members in California. California is especially being targeted to push for this, even though it's not uh, it's not the answer, and it, it's actually going to make the problem worse because there's nothing in the legislation that moves to better storage at facilities, to better storage at anywhere that it goes, and there's no real plan for looking for uh, a real permanent solution, a permanent repository. Um, and then the uh, licensing is underway right now with uh, Holtec. The um, license might be complete, uh, declared complete, in February of 2018 is the projected. That means that people will have 60 days to intervene against it and 45 days to comment on the environmental impact statement. And uh, we're waiting to see whether waste control is, license is gonna get resumed. So, next slide. Um, summarize this to say that the concept of centralized storage isn't new. Uh, when I first started in this work in the late 1970s, my area was targeted for away from reactor sites, and as was uh, that was in New York, near West Valley, uh, Barnwell, South Carolina, and um, Morris, Illinois, are three places that were targeted then. And Congress was trying to pass a law that would have uh, had all the nuclear waste in the country moved to those three locations. We were able to stop that then, and the, uh, the uh, concept of away from reactor storage kind of went away for a little bit until 1987 in the Nuclear Waste Policy Amendments Act when it came back, um, setting up the nuclear waste negotiator, looking for some monitored retrievable storage, same thing. And now in this legislation, it is called, it's called monitored retrievable storage, but it's also referred to as centralized interim storage. So it's the same fight and we've stopped it over and over again. There was one site that did get licensed in Utah and uh, private fuel storage. There were a number of reasons why it didn't um, actually proceed, but I think one of the main ones is that no utility wanted to send its waste to a place and still have liability for it. Um, there are also issues of the uh, military not even wanting it because the waste would be traveling through their land to get to it. And Kevin pretty much talked about transport, but of course it's 
it's not safe. Uh, there have been quite a few train uh, track, tra train fires and, and big disasters in the West Texas area in the last few years as this issue has been uh, raised and it makes people pretty nervous uh, that, that those shipments could actually at some point be having all of the radioactive waste from the country uh, coming through. Even the Texas uh, State uh, Agency has said that, uh, that the transport is uh, too high of a risk, that it could be a terrorist risk. I think something people don't realize, and, and when they do, they're pretty surprised. Look at your own insurance policy for your car, your house, uh, your renter's insurance, or your owner's insurance, and there's express exemption from liability for nuclear uh, accidents. Not just nuclear war, but nuclear power, and nuclear accidents are not covered. There's some pretty bad disasters going on here. People are gonna be fighting over you know, whether they can get compensation um, for the, the damages that have just happened to you in California. Um, if it's a radioactive incident, the radioactive part of it is simply not covered. Yeah, this is just a, uh, what Robert Tohey was with the Sierra Club, said that sacrificing the permanent, unique, and unreplaceable for the common and the temporary. That's what we seem to be doing. And I wanted to, in the next slide, mention the, um, uh, United Nations has um, past the, the um, United, UNDRIP, United Nations Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. And uh, they are, uh, I, all of these options are direct violations of that, of environmental justice, of sovereignty. The two sites right now in West Texas are more targeted at uh, largely Hispanic communities, people of, of color, but um, Yucca Mountain is certainly um, Western Shoshone territory. It's a violation of the Ruby Valley Treaty of 1863. They've been thinking about putting waste there. They never said okay to it. Some kids are on uranium mining uh, sites saying no to, to nuclear. And um, so in addition to being a technical disaster, it's also a societal and moral disaster to uh, be forcing these things. And I think we can stop the legislation, I think we can stop the uh, licensing of these sites, and we're gonna have to work together to do the best we can to contain what's there, and I support all the efforts to stop uh, more waste being generated here in Diablo, and thank you for all of your work um, making that happen.